Well, good afternoon and welcome to the uh, soil webinar titled Understanding Various Soil Leaching Tests presented on behalf of the TDJ Group. On behalf of our primary distributor, Jay Carpenter Environmental, we want to welcome everybody into today's webinar. <clears throat> we hope that we've got a, a good educational webinar set up uh, for everybody here. Just to quickly review uh, what we're going to cover, we're going to talk about the various types of leaching tests that are out there that can be applied to soils. We'll talk a little bit about TCLP, SPLP, MEP, and a couple other less often used testing protocols. I want to discuss a little bit about the performance of reagents, various types of fixation reagents that are used, and how they would perform or how they would act within a testing protocol like this. And then finally, to give you a little bit of insight as to which test you should be using. But before we get into the nuts and the bolts, let me introduce myself. My name is James Lively. I'm the VP of Sales and Marketing with the TDJ Group. I've been with the firm for about 25 years in various capacities of, of either in sales or some kind of a technical capacity. And what I wanted to say before we jump into the presentation here is on a couple of housekeeping notes, right now, everyone's a uh, computer on your end is muted, and that way if there's some shuffling of paper or you got some stuff going on in your office, it won't impact the listening experience for everyone else. Um, you should note that there is a dialog box probably in the upper right hand uh, section of your screen, and in that there will be a series of, of words listed there from webcam to audio, questions, um, and perhaps a couple others. Uh, pay particular attention to the questions. If you want to submit a public or a private question, uh, feel free to do so throughout the course of the webinar here. And if I have a chance, I could try to answer them as we go through. And if not, we can save them till the end. If you want to submit a question that's private in nature, meaning you don't want anybody else to know about this super top secret project you're working on, make sure you submit it through a private question. Uh, but I would encourage you, unless it's proprietary, it might be helpful for the rest of the class here if you submit a public question, as there's a good chance if you're asking or thinking about the question that somebody else is as well. Well, having said that, without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump on into the presentation. So who are we? As I said, my name is James Lively and I work with the TDJ Group. Uh, we've got a couple of different product lines, all of which serve to stabilize hazardous waste or prevent the generation of hazardous waste. We've got a corporate office in Barrington, Illinois, which is a western suburb of the beautiful city of Chicago. Um, we do have a production facility about an hour and a half south and west of downtown Chicago as well. You should note that all of our chemistries are calcium silicate, and that we serve with these uh, brands and this chemistry, three different marketplaces that either would be producing a hazardous waste that we're eliminating prior to generation or we're stabilizing after the fact. And in my time here, we've treated well over 1.5 million tons of hazardous waste. And as I mentioned earlier, we operate primarily, we go to market through our distributors and manufacturer reps. Um, Jay Carpenter Environmental is a, is a great uh, partner of the TDJ group and we're happy that they will have another warehouse operational uh, out in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, that's just outside of Philadelphia and we're very excited about that because we do understand that there's quite a bit of work going on up there that we've been able to participate in of late and this is going to give us the ability of being able to better service that market. So pretty exciting news. Now let's go ahead and get into the real nuts and bolts of today's presentation. So if we think about a soil leaching test, that phrase, there's three words there, I think we all understand what soil is. Leaching and test, maybe we need to provide a little bit more flesh on that skeleton, if you will. So I found what I think is a good definition for leaching, found it at the website listed there. I've highlighted the important parts, 
that a leaching process is a process by which inorganic and organic contaminants are released from a solid phase into a liquid phase, and you've got various chemical um, activity going on. And those chemical activities involve such things as mineral dissolution, desorption, pH, redox or redux, reduction, oxidation, it's easy for me to say, dissolved matter. I would also add chemical conversion, chemical substitution, and adsorption there as well. So if that's the leaching process, what's a leaching test? Taking that same definition above, and simply saying a leaching test would simulate the above process in a highly controlled environment that is a lab so that it's reproducible and we're using the same type of quality materials. We would run that test to determine how much leach is out and then compare that versus some kind of a regulatory standard or level. So we've talked about um, what leaching is and what a leach test is. Now we need to discuss why do we need to do a leaching test? Well, according to EPA, there's two reasons. I think they're practical reasons, but two reasons to use a leaching test. Let's look at the bottom half of this definition to determine whether or not a waste is considered hazardous or not hazardous. That's probably the most commonly um, common application for a test, in particular the TCLP test, because that's really the one that determines hazardous or not hazardous. And we'll have some more information on that at a later slide. But above and beyond simply determining hazardous or non hazardous, the other reason is to determine the effectiveness of a stabilization or a fixation reagent that we maybe have applied to a waste stream. So what I'd like to do first is kind of compare the three methods that we're gonna talk about, knowing that there are two other methods that are less, less relevant, I guess I'll say, or less used. But I'd like to talk about TCLP, SP, LP, and MEP. But let me first describe what we have laid out here in front of you. On the left-hand column, we've got from the top to the bottom, a test method moving from left to right. So it gives the acronym as well as the EPA test method. <clears throat> the next row heading is titled leaching solution, and it just describes the type of acid being used. The next um, title is leaching solution pH. This is very important to understand because it will give you better understanding of how these materials work to extract heavy metals and how highly alkaline waste or waste that's been treated with a highly alkaline stabilization material is going to interact with these acids. Extraction cycles, that's how many extractions you would run. The time in the acid bath is how long would the extraction or how long would the cycle be? <clears throat> and then finally, the simulated weathering is just a proxy for what the EPA folks believed the test method was replicating out in the real world. So let's just jump right into the TCOP, EPA method 1311. It is a, an acetic acid. Well, the reason that it's an acetic acid is very straightforward. When the EPA developed this test protocol, they developed a mismanagement scenario where industrial waste would be thrown into a municipal waste landfill, basically with decomposing waste or garbage that's in there with those organic decomposable materials, acetic acid would be generated. So even though these are industrial waste, which aren't intended to go into a municipal waste landfill, they wouldn't come up with worst case scenario and say, if it accidentally got in there, how would those onerous acids in the landfill attack and solubilize whatever is in the waste material? <clears throat> Moving down to the leaching solution pH for TCLP, it's 2.88 or 4.93. Uh, the way the TCOP test is ran is you got to test a very small sample 
a five grams when you get the sample in, test it with a standard pH test. If it's less than five, use extraction fluid number one or the extraction fluid 4.93. If that value is above five, they actually at the lab hit it with a small dose of hydrochloric acid and then they cook it for a short period of time and then they measure it. If that value is less than five, they'll use extraction fluid number one, 4.93. If it's greater than five, what that's saying is, wow, this is really alkaline waste. So they want to go to a more aggressive leach solution to be able to counter that buffering capacity. The TCLP is one cycle where effectively they've got a vessel that's got about 2,000 milligrams, I'm sorry, 2,000 milliliters of leachate solution and 100 grams of waste. Well, a milliliter of liquid is about a gram. So doing the math, 2,000 to 100, that's where they come up with a 20 to 1 liquid to solid ratio that we see in TCLP um, as well as the SPLP. And then finally, the TCLP is supposed to replicate about 100 years in a landfill. Nobody really knows, is it 100 years? Is it 112 years? Is it 87 years? No one really knows, but again, these tests are set up to simulate some real world conditions. Moving to the center column here on SPLP for the EPA method 1312, you'll see that it's a different acid. It's not acetic, it's sulfuric and nitric. And that's because going back to the name, synthetic precipitation leach procedure, synthetic precipitation is a proxy for acid rain. <clears throat> here in the Midwest, we know that very well because this was a, a concept studied in the 60s and 70s, and they basically determined that we were acidifying the eastern portion of the United States by the coal-fired power plants in the Midwest that could be spewing sulfurous and nitrous compounds into the atmosphere, as well as automobile exhaust that would do the same thing. And then the prevailing winds in the United States are from west to east predominantly, that's the reason, again, <clears throat> they would use a different extraction for soil on the eastern side of the Mississippi River versus the western side. And in fact, if you look at the leaching solutions that are selected here, if it's east of the Mississippi, because the acid rain was expected and measured to be slightly acidic, the extraction for soil there should be 4.2. If it's west of the Mississippi, it would be 5.0, because those soils don't get the same type of acidic rain exposure that the ones in the eastern half of the United States would because of acid rain. It's still a single extraction. It's still 18 plus or minus two hours. And it's about 100 years exposure, not in a landfill, but to acid rain. And then this last column here, we've got the MEP test. <laughs> You'll note that it has the same acid as SPLP, sulfuric acid, nitric acid but it's got a pH of three, so it's an even more aggressive solution. Further, if you look at the extraction cycles, there's nine total. They run a individual TCLP test. That's with the acetic acid that replicates disposal in a sanitary landfill. Then they take that same sample and put it back into sulfuric nitric acid, kind of simulating exposure to acid rain. Um, and they do that nine times. So with a low pH acid and extracting it 10 times, what you're really doing is you're eliminating any potential buffering capacity. And because it's 10 year, um, 10 cycles, it's, it's estimated to replicate about a thousand years exposure. So what I've done here is I've just laid out five common TC, um, leaching tests. And let me just start the very beginning on the EP toxicity test or the extraction procedure test. That's EPA method 1310. It's used prior to the TCLP. Um, and it was at the time the federally required test to determine hazardous or non-hazardous. It's still a validated test method, but it's no longer the de facto test to determine hazardous or not hazardous. That's the TCLP test. 
Now I have listed here not only the method number, but the data was added to SW846. SW846 is basically a collection of all the test methods for evaluating solid waste that the EPA puts together and updates on a semi-regular basis. The date that's listed here is a date that is published in that particular manual, meaning that it's not only been validated, but it's gone through public comment period, and now it's published for, uh, for final application. We also have the synthetic precipitation leach procedure, which was brought online in 1992. The, uh, the old man of the group here, or the old, old person of the group is a multiple extraction procedure, which was added in 1986. And LEAF is pretty new. It's been studied for about a decade. It's been validated. It's right now out for public comment period, so it hasn't been published in SW846 to my knowledge. Um, we've got a slide on the LEAF that we'll get to just a little bit later here. So the TCOP. So it's designed, as we mentioned earlier, to simulate leaching in a mismanagement scenario where it's disposed of in a municipal or sanitary landfill where trash can decompose and create acetic acid conditions. The TCOP estimates not only inorganic mobility, but also organic contaminant mobility for solids, liquids, and other uh, multi-phase waste. Again, keep in mind, TCOP is the only test that you can run um, to determine if a waste is a hazardous or non-hazardous waste from a disposal standpoint. SPLP was designed to simulate, as we kind of alluded to earlier, the synthetic precipitation that it would be exposed to. So the theory is these waste materials are on the ground being exposed to acid rain with slightly acidic leachate media or leachate medium, I should say. Uh, the SPLP, just like the TCOP and just like MEP, determines the mobility of organic and inorganic contaminants present in liquid soils and waste. And finally, the MEP, uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's designed to simulate what waste would encounter in a mismanagement scenario when it goes into a sanitary landfill. But then it also gives exposure to a very aggressive acidic rain, nine additional extraction. And that continuous exposure to fresh acid uh, eliminates the pH of either high pH or high alkaline waste or a stabilization reagent that's got a high pH factor to it. And perhaps it's the only way that you're able to pass a TCOP test. This test eliminates that. So you can really tell, are you just fooling the TCOP test? Are you actually creating a long-term stable bond? So which test should I use? That's probably the question you're asking yourself. Well, if it's for disposal of waste as hazardous or non-hazardous, it's only the TCOP test. If you want to assess long-term stability, especially if you've got a waste that's highly alkaline by itself, or you're adding a reagent that's highly alkaline like a calcium oxide or magnesium oxide, um, you would want, want to run the multiple extraction procedure or the MEP. And if you're simulating acid rain, then you'd want to run the synthetic precipitation leach procedure. And as a side note, um, we are seeing more and more projects consider SPLP if it's going to be an in situ stabilization project, meaning the, the waste with the treatment reagent will be left on site. So the exposure would be to precipitation coming from above. That's the reason um, that the SPLP is being given some consideration here. So the next couple of slides really talks about the acidic nature of the leachate. All of them were under five. A neutral pH is between seven and an eight. So as you can see, all these leachates are very acidic. There is a process within heavy metal stabilization called amphotericy, or you can say that lead or cadmium, as an example, exhibit amphoteric behavior. And what that means in this next slide I'm going to flash forward to is the x-axis is on the bottom, pH from left to right, high to low. Solubility is the y-axis. The bottom here is low solubility, high solubility. 
you'll see the lead hydroxide and the cadmium hydroxide as examples. But you'll also note that all of these are U-shaped curves, meaning that there's a minimum solubility point, and then when you get higher on the pH, lower on the pH, you have significant increases in the solubility of these hydroxides. And that's important because if you have an acid that you've got waste in, if you know that I can add a calcium oxide or a mag oxide and artificially increase the pH without doing something else to create a new stable compound, and you know amphoterosy of heavy metals, you, you, can, you, can, you can get really close to creating a non-hazardous waste by simply adding just enough material to get it in that minimum solubility range. And you might get a pass, but it's very difficult to maintain that. It's more art than science, if you will. And the challenge, and this next slide I'm gonna to get to here, is you can add calcium oxide or mag oxide. You can get a pass on the TCLP, but have, have I just artificially increased the leaching solution so I hit that minimum solubility point, but I've not really created a long-term stay of waste? Because what happens when you put this waste out in the ground for ISS or in the landfill, it's going to be exposed to moisture that moisture is going to interact and eliminate the buffering capacity over time, right? So if that's the case, why would you add something that is temporary in nature to get a temporary pass? Because the problem is, if it gets exposed to additional leachate, acid rain in the future, the metals may become soluble again, and now you've got some problems. So, so this is really just kind of summarizing everything we just went over. On the TCLP, the two pH values are 2.88 and 4.93. If we're talking about lead, then we want that value to be of about nine if we're only trying to fool the TCLP test. If you add a little bit too much, you actually cause it to go more hazardous. If you don't add enough, it's going to be hazardous. So it's kind of like Goldilocks. You need just the right amount, which again kind of speaks to the difficulty in hitting that target every time. With SBLP, similar scenario, acidic materials, if you're trying to get up to nine, to get a pass on the TCLP, you can carefully try to dose it, but it's difficult and very unpredictable. Finally, with the MEP tests, we have seen on those materials that artificially buffer the um, the acid being used by that second or third extraction keep in mind the MEP had 10 extractions but by that second or third extraction we've already um, eliminated the pH buffering impact and as a result of that anything that is available for leaching will leach out Now, if you could just bear with me, I've got uh, two more slides here. This last slide is some information on the latest kind of leaching research that's out there. There's a protocol called LEAP, or Leaching Environmental Assessment Framework. It was one that was done in collaboration with Vanderbilt University and the EPA. It involves four different types of leaching methods based upon what you're trying to accomplish and change changes things such as the liquid to solid ratio, how you actually adjust for the pH during the actual test itself. So it's a pretty involved test. Um, as you can see, it's got four different methods here. It's been validated by EPA. It hasn't been published yet because it's still in public comment period. So you probably want to make yourself at least familiar with this test so that if it ends up becoming mandated in the future, you've at least got some understanding of it. Uh, this test is pretty expensive. Well, we've heard between five and ten thousand dollars per test, depending upon which of these tests you need to run. Which, by the way, I think I mentioned MEP test is about two thousand dollars, TCLP and SPLP about one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars. And my final slide is just going to be a little bit of a highlight to what I mentioned early on at the TDJ Group, the company that I manufacture we manufacture calcium silicate products that we call Blastox and Bantox. They have three different reactions. 
two chemical and one physical. There is a pH adjustment, and I know I've been hammering against that, but what I'm really saying is don't allow pH adjustment to be the only way you're stabilizing your waste. You need a con chemical conversion component, and if you can also add encapsulation, which physically limits the amount of leachate getting to it or the amount that could leach out, um, now you've got three different safeguards. This has all been proven out by independent agencies of EPA, Federal Highway, and the U.S. Department of Defense through the Army Corps of Engineers, where they prove from their own testing, not only does it pass TCOP and MEP, but the MEP, the long-term stability one, they conclude offers long-term immobilization and durability, which from our standpoint is kind of a, um, an endorsement. Uh, I'm not saying EPA has endorsed it, but what I am saying is that the EPA has concluded this is a very effective long-term stability uh, reagent. Um, we've got some limited success with SPLP. That's not to say we've only worked in certain areas and not in other areas, but we've been limited in the amount of SPLP tests that we need to run because most of the time it's not required, except as I said earlier, it does seem that there is a potential trend or maybe a trend emerging where SPLP is more of the in situ stabilization testing protocol. And finally, I wanna let you know that we do offer a free treatability study. If you participate in today's webinar, we'd love to test your waste to demonstrate the efficacy of our material for your heavy metal remediation project. And we also offer a certificate of compliance. So at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up the presentation and get to the questions.